So, good morning everybody and welcome. Um, I am happy to see you here and uh, I hope you will enjoy the coming uh, semester with me here. Um, I'm going to uh, give a lecture now on quantitative big imaging. And it's a lot based on um, experiences I have during experiments myself. And then I've added on some material to make it a more complete lecture. And um, today I'm mainly going to talk about what this course is about, motivating why we want to do quantification in imaging, also what is an image uh, from a technical point of view, and where do they come from. Then I'm switching over a little bit to science and reproducibility. And in the end, I'm also mentioning a little bit about workflows, how to work with it. The course webpage is um, on GitHub. So um, this is a webpage on GitHub IO and the whole, all lecture material is available on GitHub. So you can always uh, download it from there. And um, the whole course will be done in the framework in the of Python. And um, each notebook uh, or each lecture note will be introduced by this kind of um, introduction. So it's um, loading a lot of libraries that are needed to pre create these uh, lectures. And um, the whole lecture is actually a Jupyter Notebook. So you can actually go in and check how I did different figures. Sometimes there is a lot of padding and stuff that you maybe don't have to look at in the beginning. But if you want to do nice plots, then it makes sense to take a look at it. So sometimes there is a lot of clutter. And um, I hope you will not be too confused about that because I will try to point out this is the relevant part and this is for visualization. So um, actually I already ran this, but um, usually when you're working in a notebook to execute a cell, you press shift enter and then it happens. But I already did this here, so I don't have to do it. We will look more into working with notebooks in the exercises. Then um, a little bit about the course, who we are, who you are, what is expected, and also why this class exists at all. And uh, then I also give a little bit of a course outline. And first me, well, I did some scribble here, I see. I tested my technology. Um, anyway, uh, my name is Anders Kestner. I'm um, from Sweden, but been in Switzerland now for about 20 years. I've been the fif last 15 years about beamline scientist at Paul Scherer Institute, working with neutron imaging. And uh, before that, I was also algorithm developer, particularly for com computer tomography. And then I did a postdoc here at ETH and in, um, Institute for Terrestrial Ecology. And I don't think that exists anymore because of reorganizations. And before that, I did my PhD in signal processing at Chalmers U University of Technology in Sweden. And uh, then a guy that you will not see today, he is away. So um, um, he will come next week. That's uh, Stefano van Gogh, and he's a PhD student in the X-ray microscopy group at, uh, here at ETH and also at the Swiss Light Source at the uh, Polscher Institute. And he will be my teaching assistant and support you uh, during the exercises. So, who are you? This is a little bit a guess, but there are very different backgrounds in people coming to this course. So we have art history researchers, people from the museum coming here. We have chemists, mechanical engineers, and uh, biomedical engineers, computer scientists, physicists, and agronomy can also appear. So there is a lot of different interests in working with images. And also from the skill and complexity, what you have 
already experienced. There are different levels. So if you look, start looking at the kind of data you're working with, it can be very simple data or it can be very complicated data. The background, how you work with a computer, could be that you more prefer drawing, marking up, or you maybe have a more computer science background, so you prefer writing script. And then, of course, you have different levels of experience. You can be the toddler who is just starting to uh, learning how to work with images and maybe even programming. And then we have the advanced climber who uh, more or less know everything. Then maybe the question is why here? But anyway, um, they can be quite advanced people, but still want to have the whole overview of the whole material that I'm going to present. So how will this work? We have a little bit adaptive uh, assignments. So the basic idea is that you shouldn't actually have to know too much programming. Well, you should have seen one or two lines of code and understand a little bit the basics, but not very much. But the, the notebooks that we do for the exercises are meant to be able to follow step by step. And um, yeah, sometimes I don't succeed completely, but um, I try to have it in that way that you should be able to follow what's going on. And then there is also the possibility to create your own custom implementations and do more complicated, but that comes later in the class. And um, what we do here in this course, we have, of course, the lectures, and then there are exercises, usually one set per lecture, and um, they are optional, so I'm not going to sign you off that that is fixed or not. So it's more for your understanding. So the idea is that you're going to learn from a pra practical point of view, how to work with data, images, in and creating a workflow that makes sense in order to get this quantitative information. Maybe helping your master project or your PhD project, etc. And um, the basic level is that we're working with you with your notebooks. You will see them later if you haven't seen them before. And if you want to go really advanced, then of course you can write your own Python classes and the Java classes or C++. I can support it, but it's not necessary to do for this course. And um, actually, there is already so much done already, in particularly in Python, that it's not really necessary to write your own algorithms unless you're really interested to understand how it works on the depth or even want to develop something new. Then there is a project. And this project, again, is optional, but there is a strong point in doing it because that's really the chance where you can work, dig deep down into your own data or maybe some data that we provide and to really learn how the whole workflow is going through the different parts of the analysis. And um, for example, you can take a little piece of your own master project or PhD project, and um, then you will have the advantage that you can get feedback from me or Stefano uh, about how to analyze your data. And then in the end, of course, there will be a presentation where you show what you have achieved, the way you have analyzed the data, and uh, some results. Then we have the whole overview. This is actually, I think there is some data here. I don't think I updated this completely. Uh, but anyway, the correct list is also on the web page for the, for the course. And there you're on this list on the web page, you also have links to the lecture notes, to lecture recordings and exercises. So everything is in this weekly list. Then there is a lot of material you can read and um, to get a little bit more background, if you like, uh, some about the reproducibility, cloud computing, and um, there is some food for the thought, how to work 
why we need to work in a specific way in order to be reproducible uh, in our um, analysis. And um, then there are also some books. One is uh, this book by John Ross. It's a quite thick brick. You can download it uh, from uh, ETH library. And uh, it gives you a nice overview of different methods. Maybe it doesn't go into the depth, but it mostly have some reference recipe towards how we can solve different problems. Then there is the book on uh, image processing, processing with Python. And um, as a complement, uh, we can also use morphometry with R. R is another language which I honestly never learned myself, but there is the theory part in this book is actually quite relevant for how to measure shapes of objects. So as long as you are in the uh, domain eth.ch, you can download these books or else you can at least do it over VPN. So the motivation, why are you here at all? So you have done an experiment. Yay, you got some beam time, you're happy. And um, that's fun. You're sitting, sweating, not sleeping for uh, about three days uh, during the experiment. And afterwards, you come back with a pile of hard drives. OK, what to do next? You have to analyze it somehow. And in the beginning, if you didn't were so involved maybe in the whole planning of setting it up or uh, how to organize the whole experiment in a good way, you may stumble into one or two problems. And one of the problems is that you have a lot of data. You can have, well, gigabytes is easy, terabytes, and then you start getting into some trouble because you can't do it with manual methods anymore. Actually, gigabytes is also already quite tough. So this is what we are going to uh, towards, finding different ways to address the steps of how to analyze these images. And in the end, we want to understand our data. And if you look at this graph, it's maybe a little bit small for some of you back on the back row. But in the beginning, we have data, we have the acquisition, we have some reduction, maybe some tomographic reconstruction, filtering, but it's still data. It doesn't have a meaning. It's just numbers. And then we start doing segmentation. Then we're starting identifying different regions. And um, then it maybe starts making sense. Then the next step is doing a labeling. Then you mark up that this region must be that kind of feature. That region is another feature. Or you want just to know the individuals and comparing them somehow. But that is a labeling step. And then you do measurements. Maybe you want to know the shape, orientation, how much it moves, etc. Then we come to measurements. And now you can see that we increase the level of abstraction. Now we're starting adding more knowledge into our data. Then we do classification based on the measurements and uh, some inference in the end. And then we can say really this treatment does something, this treatment doesn't do it or do, does it uh, differently. And that is what we want to see in the end as the result of our experiment. And um, the confusion part is that many, they get stuck already in this level. This level, then you already start integrating what you know yourself from your own background but it's about making the bridge between having the data and what you want to know. So how to proceed? Let's do some images. We get a nice re reconstruction. Then we do some fancy stuff and maybe some magic stuff. And uh, then we do a little bit of complicated stuff and then we do some math. And in the end, we come to the conclusion that, uh, well, science as ice cream is good for your bones. Um, well, it's not really supposed to be like this, but um, we have to really learn to have a very well-described procedure where we want to know 
what is happening in each and how does it affect the next step. And um, doing it on one single image is quite easy. You can actually do it with your drawing program, marking up. There's this one, that's another one, that's another one, and so on. But then we start doing it on 10 images, 100 images, 1,000 images. And then it starts getting quite labor intense to do it. And uh, then we have to have a way to automate. So you only do it so that it works well for one or subset. Make sure that it really generalized sufficiently. And then you start a big script that does it. And then the computer is getting hot. And you can go and have a coffee. That is the main idea about uh, doing a good uh, processing. And uh, you have different um, a, a life cycle of the experiment. So you start doing some experimental design where you find the right technique. You have identified, you want to um, do imaging, for example. And then, depending on the sample, you may need to add some dice. You have to uh, be make sure that the samples are consistent between the measurements. And um, that's actually quite a large preparation work to make sure that you really get the images you need to answer your questions. Because without planning, you can usually start from the beginning again. Or usually I say, when a new user comes to me, they need about three experiments, unless it's just a simple tomography, uh, they need about three experiments until they have refined the technique they want need to answer their questions. The first one is just knowing the method. Okay, now we know how it works. Next one, now refined, usually too complicated. And then in the end, they come up with something that actually can produce the data they need. Then we do the measurements. And uh, then is the question, can we measure sufficiently fast? Can we measure with the resolution needed? And um, that can vary a lot. And um, sometimes we need to go to different source because the intensity of the source is not sufficient. And um, then we come to the next step, which is management. And that's actually handling all the data. How do you store it? How do you make sure that it comes from point A to point B? And how can you make sure that you can do an, the right processing in an efficient way? And uh, finally, we come to the post-processing, which is actually what this lecture is mainly about. And that is how to really go through the data and extract the parameters. And um, that can be quite time consuming. And uh, whoops, now something stopped here. I hope uh, I didn't stop my recording. No, it seems to be on there still. Good. Um, so, looking at the distribution of how much time is spent, this is very small text, sorry for that. Um, in principle, what this plot is showing is experimental time breakdown, and the red bar is uh, experimental design, then we have the green is management, blue is um, the measurement itself, and then we have the post-processing. And what you can see over the years, depending on different techniques, but I think this one is based on a synchrotron tomography. Here you can see that um, around um, the millennium shift, we had quite long time for the measurement, some time for the management, and of course we had a considerable fraction for the post-processing. And that fraction is not really changing so much, but what is changing a lot is the beam time. You can see here from this pretty big chunk, almost, I would say a third, uh, it goes down here to 10%, then here, mm, what is it, maybe a few percent, and here in the end, with the high speed acquisition, you can really get tomographies, one tomography per second or even more. And then you produce vast amounts of data, and with that amount of data, you also have a considerable amount of data management before you can get on to doing the post-processing. And then once you have done that, you can go on to the post-processing. So you can see here how things are balancing 
in different ways over the years. So what we have is, um, I mentioned already that we can do many tomographies in short time. And um, the thing is that our detectors, they always get faster and they get bigger. Ten year, uh, 20 years ago, we maybe worked with 1K, 1K cameras, and now we work with 4K, 4K cameras for the scientific uh, applications. And of course, that is a factor 16 already, just by the, the detector size. And uh, then they get faster, they can do the readout faster, uh, sources get, get stronger, and with that we can also increase our frame rates. So um, here is an example of a 2.5K camera, which um, does 15, uh, 1,500 um, projections per second, then we produce 8 gigabytes per second. And um, typical software that people work with, like MATLAB, Aviso, Dragonfly, Python, they would be more or less saturated after 60 seconds on a normal computer. So you need a strategy how to actually handle this data, loading it in and out before you saturate the computer. And then there are some single camera examples. If you follow those links, there's more curiosities. And um, some of them can produce three times as many images per second as was produced at Instagram. But that must have been a couple of years ago. But anyway, it's a vast amount of data produced by these uh, devices. And then we have different sources of images. We can have X-ray images uh, where we have um, X-ray microtomography. We can have CSACs, diffraction patterns, and uh, nanoscopium beamline, uh, which produces actually 10 terabytes per day. And the files, they are 10 to 500 gigabytes. So it's really huge data we are talking about. A normal laptop wouldn't be able to handle this by far. In optical, we have light sheet microscopy, also producing 500 megabytes per second, or high-speed confocal images, which um, also produce 80 megabytes per second. So it's really a lot. And then you can go on the personal um, level. Let's see if I can move it up. Yep. Um, well, we have the GoPro, uh, this is also some years ago, but also that one can produce 60 megabytes per second if you would set it in a high frame, frame rate and high resolution. And it already co only costs six about $600. There is also this FPS uh, 1000, which produce 400 megabytes per second. So it's really a lot of data can be uh, produced by even by cheap uh, equipment. So, handling masses of data. So, um, I'm quite fond of taking um, XKCD examples. But anyway, in principle, if you analyze data, you produce more data. Because you, you keep the raw data, and then you do some, say, filtering, then you have double the data already. And then you do some, maybe, segmentation something, then you have added on even more and more and more and more. So in the end, the whole workflow results in quite a lot of data. But um, it's at least good that it's only in the beginning that it increases linearly and then it tapers off. Because uh, when you do the segmentation and labeling, you can actually reduce the number of bits you need. The segmentation is actually just um, usually, say, maximum four bits. So that is a huge reduction y compared to maybe 32 bits floating point. Labeling is the same, could, uh, well, could be the same. And then we do the measurements, then we are already moving over to t uh, tables, and then it's just a list of values. So we have item one, has that area, that shape, etc., etc. So then it's really a big data reduction we're talking about. And when you do starting doing inference, modeling, then in the end, to put it very blunt, uh, it would be that you only have um, model parameters. And they were, they, those are few, so it's a very small table in the end. So um, if you're going to work with large data, then of course you have to prepare to buy a lot of hard drives. 
So, what is a terabyte? If you look at these images, it's 1K by 1K. That's one megapixel. Every second, how long would it take? Anyone? You have one megapixel and one to terabyte, which is a thousand times more. No, a million times more, sorry. <laughs> So let's take a look at it. Let's see if I can move over with the mouse. Whoops, there he is. So let's execute this. Actually, I did already. So you would have to sit 140 hours to watch a terabyte of this kind of images if you watch them one per second. So one image looking at it, one image looking at it, and so on. It's a lot of time. So you can't do it. That is more or less the message. And, uh, oops, so now I need to reactivate it in the right way again. So now we can look at what kind of data we are accessing here. And um, first we would like to look at this image. It's some bone structures here. And we want to know how many bone cells there are in this slice. And um, our criteria is we should actually ignore those who are too big or maybe have strange shapes. And um, then we want to maybe to answer the question, are there more to the left than to the right? Or are the ones to the left bigger than the ones to the, to the left? So, or top and bottom. So looking at distributions between uh, these items, how they are distributed in the image. So that would be a thing. On one image, well, you could probably do it. Sit there a couple of minutes and then you could probably tell. Qualitatively, you could probably tell quite fast. But um, now let's make it a little bit harder. Now we do it again, but now we have 96 samples and this time, to make it more fun, we do tomography. So now we have 2,000 slices of the same kind. And, uh, well, then it's not so easy to do it manually anymore. And to make it even more, let's do it with 1,090 samples. And uh, we need that kind of number of samples for the analysis to really make statistical conclusions about different treatments, different ages, different whatever, biological parameters. And now is the question how to analyze this, how to measure, what to measure, do it efficiently, uh, do it in doing it efficiently. And in this particular case, the measurement, measuring over a thousand samples, was done with a robot that took the sample, moved it in, scanned it, took it out, took the next, and so on. So they had automatized the whole acquisition process. But still, that then fills the hard drives, but uh, now we need a strategy how to continue from that. And um, then it gets even more fun because um, which metrics are we, do we want to look at? How can we quantify the information we want to have? And sometimes we even have the soft kind of metrics and uh, things like how aligned are the cells with each other? Um, is the group um, more or less aligned in uh, left or right? And uh, well, it gets more and more complicated and you really have to find a way to give a metric to uh, do this analysis. Of course, there are also, call it soft uh, quantification. If you go into uh, the machine learning, you can say attributed to different soft labels, of course. But um, having routines that uh, work with these soft uh, metrics is not always so easy. And um, then we can do it even more fun. Let's see if I can convince this one. No, I couldn't. Oops. So, um, let's see, I need a mouse pointer. There it is. So, here we have a foam, and um, in the experiment, 
We want to know how many bubbles there are, how fast they're moving, are they moving faster along the walls or in the middle? Maybe is it that uh, large bubbles move faster or um, are they rearranging? Maybe they are merging and so on. So this information is something that we would like to see from this experiment. And uh, now we can bring in some scientific method. So what is the purpose to begin with? So what we want to do is to discover and validate new knowledge. So we have our idea, our hypothesis, that we want to compare something, make a conclusion out of it, and that needs to be proven. And um, it's used to convince other people that it's actually happening. And um, of course, we should build on the results of others. So there comes the library visit. So we don't start from the beginning. And um, we can, of course, do some qualitative assessment. And it's in the beginning, it's very important to look at data, getting an idea how it behaves. But um, one thing about the qualitative is that it's maybe not so easy to do on large scale and definitely not, um, not easy to reproduce. The quantitative analysis <coughs> is, of course, far from perfect, but at least it will provide us some metric. And uh, in the end, it's your task to define what is the metric you actually want to show. And um, that is what you then are going to put the computers on working on. And um, science and imaging, then we can look at um, images. So actually, stepping back, back one step, the human eye is fantastic and the brain in combination with it. You can very quickly spot that that group is something and that group is something else. But convincing the computer to do the same is not very easy. And um, often you have very fussy information in the images on grade levels that just vary a little bit. And compared to, for example, just using the temperature, measuring temperature of something, then you have a thermometer, you measure, okay, it's easy, it's 50K, that's it. But if you're looking at images, you have a lot of spatial information and maybe, maybe even temporal information that you need to include in the analysis. And uh, it's very easy to go wrong here. And uh, sometimes by just changing a little bit of a parameter somewhere, you can get maybe 10% more volume. So it's really important to keep track of how you do your analysis and making sure that it's validated, that it doesn't add or remove too much information. And of course, there is it's, it's a living field of, uh, of research, image processing, and there are thousands of algorithms available. Probably also multiple versions of the same algorithm. People implement it differently with small modifications in the math or in the code. So there is a lot of um, variations here. And then of course there are thousands of tools, well, probably because each uh, PhD think he can do it uh, better himself. So starts writing and um, that's uh, why they're getting so many tools. But I actually say, make the starting point that assume someone did it before you and um, look for libraries. And usually you find the function you need. That's much easier than starting from scratch, coding it up. And um, the analysis, the one thing is the algorithms, but actually to get the analysi analysis done, you need to do a chain of different operations. And um, another thing is also that experiment with this can be quite time consuming. And um, yeah, right now I'm sitting with a data set where it takes two hours to get the whole thing out. Uh, of course, I can reduce it a bit, but sometimes it's actually needed to do the whole two hours waiting before you can see the result out of, um, of the analysis. And, well, you can drink a lot of coffee, of course, but um, you can also do other things. 
And honestly, the thing that is most annoying when you do this analysis are things that take something like between 10, and 30 sec uh, 10 seconds and a minute. It's so fast you can't do anything else. So you're sitting actually waiting on the computer. And that's quite annoying. So, important questions we can uh, talk about. Um, of course, nice renderings. They're very beautiful, like this uh, little um, gold piece is actually dug out in, in Sweden from pre-Viking age. And uh, of course, we can do very beautiful renderings and uh, they look almost natural. But um, and that can be actually also used to make conclusions about manufacturing techniques, how people were working with these samples. But what we also want to have, and actually the goal here, is to do some more quantitative information. So in this case, it's a bivariate histogram where we look at the information from X-rays and neutrons together, looking at corrosion. And there we can make different conclusions about the composition of a sample and doing a better segmentation. And um, in the end, decide if one treatment of um, uh, ancient iron preservation is better than the other. So that was the goal of that investigation. The initial questions you should ask, because you should actually ask a couple of questions before you even start setting up your experiment, is what am I looking for? And so really good. Why am I? <laughs> um, and um, sometimes what you're looking for may be too specific or maybe too general. And that you have to specify and re shape this question in a way that you can really implement it as an experiment that works all the way through the acquisition process and also the analysis to provide the, the answers you need. And um, next question is how you can plan your experiment to make it easier to analyze the data. Sometimes if you do it in a way that um, maybe is a little bit awkward for the exper during experiment time, you may gain hours and days in the analysis. So it may be worth considering. And sometimes it doesn't cost extra to do it in the right way. So why not do it? So really, it's important to plan before you do the experiment with the intention that you will analyze the data. And uh, the question about vocabulary Sometimes if you come from a field which is not really signal image processing, you may need to translate your initial question in a way that it can actually be used when you do the analysis. So it's really a vocabulary thing. Sometimes that's actually really confusing sometimes that people are using the same name for different things or for with different meaning in one in the target area, what I'm thinking right now of is texture of crystalline materials. And Im image processing, texture is just a pattern on the image. And um, that can sometimes uh, reduce, uh, result in um, confusing um, discussions. Next time I will bring my power unit. And um, then also important is how much a priori information do you have already? And can you use it in the analysis? Sometimes it's actually quite useful to give the analysis boundary condition. Like um, a bubble cannot be larger than, say, some size. Definitely not larger than the, the vessel that they are transported in. And uh, then <coughs> the reasons why, why you're doing it. So it could be that you want to compare some treatments, you want to understand and model a process, or you can also maybe think about uh, just inspecting different components. So what is the purpose of the experiment? One is, of course, sample characterization. You want to get some model parameters. and. Um, you may want to compare the treatments, and in the end, you maybe also want to have some beautiful 3D visualization because your professor thinks it's good for showing in his uh, 
annual report slides, so you need to do that too. And um, so what can we measure actually? And I just want to get rid of that. So um, what kind of information do you want to extract? You, there are two main routes. Probably they will be merged anyway in the end, but one is quantification from, from the gray levels. So really getting conclusions of how the gray levels are changing in the image. That could be a saturation of something, um, material composition. So if you have a mixture between something and an alloy, it could also be material transport. If you have some tracer element moving around in your uh, sample or in your let's say, a tracer in the body when you do a tracer experiment. But it could also be that you want to quantify shapes. And um, one thing is just to identify and count items. How many do I have? So if I have rice on the table, it's usually quite useless, but it could also be like a counting task that you want to see how many rice grains you have on the table. And um, then you can wa would want to measure the volume. For example, in the bubble experiment, you want to see the volume distribution within these bubbles. And um, then we have the shape. Different treatments may, for example, change the shape of a cell, that they um, look differently depending on if the cells are happy or unhappy, or if they are um, set through some different conditions, and so on. And another thing is also why quantitative um, is again coming back to the human eye. It's always this optical illusion, which uh, square in the center is brighter than the other. And um, I already said it's an optical illusion. Actually, they have exactly the same gray level in these two. And that can be very confusing when you start interpreting qualitatively. <coughs> and um, in order to make this conclusion correct, we need to have the statistics and also some subjective descriptions. And then we can look at intensity gradients and um, that one I need to execute. I see. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So it could be that we have this kind of intensity gradient and um, looking at it, no, that was only one. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's easy like this. Here you can actually, with the human eye, maybe with this beamer and this light conditions, you, it's hard to see with the difference between zero and one. And the human eye can, I think, can see up to, what is it, 16 or 32 gray levels. But w if you go beyond that, in the images we are talking about, we may have floating point values in each, each pixel. We may have 16 bits, so that's 65,000 gray levels. And even a normal picture has eight bit gray levels, so that's 256 levels. And uh, then it's very difficult to distinguish, is that one darker or is that one brighter? And of course, you should select the right tools for your task. And uh, you have different criteria for doing this. And uh, to begin with, how many samples do I have? It's a starting point. How complex is the sample to analyze? Is human interpretation needed? Sometimes it's actually needed some kind of human in interpretation. And um, what is the end product? What is it you want to get out of these images? And um, of course, natural question, as I said before, someone else may have already done this um, analysis. So are there these uh, tools available already? And um, also looking a little bit in the future, will there be similar data sets in the future? Will you do a series of experiments or is it the only one that you do? That brings us to the choices. You can work with interactive tools. So that is small data sets that you work with, the, with some level of interaction. Then we have the scripting using ex, uh, existing toolboxes. 
And uh, the extreme case is you really need to develop your own algorithms. And uh, well, that's the most time consuming. And of course, here it says I'm doing a lot of work. So it's in theory, it's just a bump here that you have some extra work to do. And then afterwards, you can automatize everything. And uh, the danger is that you start writing code and then you realize uh, <laughs> it didn't work. I need to debug. And then, no, that was the wrong one. And then we rethink, and then it ends up that you are just developing code and not answering the questions that you want to do. So this is something to be careful and um, to avoid. And uh, well, it's a easy trap to fall in. So be aware of it. Then we have, um, well, actually, it's almost break. Uh, it's actually break time. So I have a few slides more on this part, and then we switch to images. Can we continue? Yeah. Uh, so we have um, the question about reproducibility and repeatability. They are very similar uh, words, but they have a little bit different meaning. So on re reproducibility, we have a method you describe or someone else describe. You do your analysis and come to a result. And then someone else takes this description and does the same analysis in their way and they should get to the same result. This is the ha quite hard to achieve because there are always things coming in between but usually you could should be able to land in the same order of magnitude or within some error margin. Repeatability is a little bit less strict. There you have the same data but different people d use the same analysis tool and uh, when you compare the results, they should be the same. And that is the point where the human interaction is put into a t onto test, because different people mark up things differently, and that can actually give some bias in the result afterwards. And that is uh, what we need to avoid, that this bias comes into play. And. Um, In principle, the con uh, consequence is that um, we would, in principle, want to have um, reproducibility, but what we can mostly have to settle with is the repeatability. And um, things can change so much all the time, and um, I think it's uh, usually the most uh, pragmatic thing is to at least having ensuring re uh, repeatability. And with image processing and images, everything changes so much and there are so many fuzzy details that it's, um, and it's also a multi-step process to do it that um, makes it hard to really guarantee that you can do a reproducible analysis. And um, of course, we, um, need to keep track of ourselves, what we're doing. And one thing is we need to uh, document every analysis step, making sure that it's doing what it should. And uh, one thing is writing clear and understandable code, which I have seen very many examples of that it doesn't always happen. It's mostly about having the solution done or problem solved and then go to the next step because you don't have the time to clean up what you have done. And um, it's really important to have clean code, in particular if we're working in a team and um, someone else has to work with your code afterwards, then it's uh, important to have this part really clear. Oh, it continues and continues. So I think we uh, make a short break here and um, then um, we go on with the images afterwards. <laughs>